Well, good evening and uh, welcome to uh, Simon Fraser University's Harbour Centre campus. Uh, let me start by acknowledging the Coast Salish peoples on whose traditional territory we're privileged to gather this evening. Indeed, all three of our campuses are on Coast Salish territory, the unceded territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish and Musqueam peoples. Uh, my name is Andrew Petter. I'm president of Simon Fraser University. And one of my most pleasurable duties is to uh, introduce uh, speakers in the President's Faculty Lecture Series. Uh, this is the third lecture in uh, the 2014-2015 series. And the series was started uh, as a community lecture series as part of uh, our vision to be an engaged university. Uh, and what does that mean? It means we really want to be a university that has a special relationship with the communities we serve, uh, a university that is there to build capacity within the communities, and to draw support from the community in a very uh, close relationship. Indeed, we've made it our goal to be Canada's most community-engaged research university. And what we want to do, therefore, is provide opportunities for members of the public to hear from and engage with our leading research faculty. Uh, and that's exactly what these lectures are designed to do, uh, to give you that opportunity to foster enlightenment, to promote dialogue on issues of public interest, and to strengthen the relationship between the university and the community. Uh, in the past, we talked about universities as ivory towers. Uh, we don't want to be an ivory tower. We would rather be a public square uh, and an opportunity to, to really uh, nurture uh, the community as the community supports and nurtures us. Uh, there'll be a chance uh, following tonight's lecture to ask some questions and offer some comments. Uh, you're also welcome to stay and continue the conversation. We have some very modest res uh, refreshments at a reception to follow just out the door here. Uh, but it is a chance to, uh, to talk amongst each other and to also talk to our guest lecturer and, and carry the conversation forward. And I'll also just uh, let you know that the lecture will be filmed and afterwards I'll come around with a microphone for those of you who want to ask questions so we can make sure people who are watching uh, subsequently uh, through the SFU YouTube channel can hear your questions as well as the answers that are given. Well, with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor uh, Sasha Colby. Sasha is an associate professor in SFU's World Literature Program, and she was recently appointed director of our Graduate Liberal Studies uh, Program. In that capacity, she oversees a broad-based interdisciplinary program that allows working adults to pursue graduate studies part-time and earn a Master of Arts in Liberal Studies. So this is really a program for people in the community, and we're hoping that some people who may be here tonight or watching will take advantage of the opportunity uh, uh, to participate in that program. In fact, I know there's some people in the audience tonight who are students or have been students in that program. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There you go. And I hope everyone's noting how happy and satisfied you all are. <laughs> the program distinguishes itself in its commitment to a community of learning with small seminars to encourage discussion, debate, and dialogue, as befits an engaged university. Uh, students explore classical and contemporary ideas, interacting with other students from many different walks of life and with faculty members from across the university. So it's a really exciting program. And we're really fortunate to have Sasha uh, leading it. Uh, Sasha just, I just found out, Sasha grew up on Gabriola Island, not too far from here. So she is a local talent, but she is someone who brings great knowledge and understanding uh, to us. Um, and uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to hearing, as I'm sure you are, tonight's presentation. That presentation is going to reflect her current research, which is situated at the intersection of literature and theater. It asks how literature and its context can be newly explored, represented, and disseminated through dramatization and other forms of embodiment. And here's a real treat. Her lecture is going to be followed by a performance from her recent, recent book, Staging Modernist Lives, H.D., Mina Loy, Nancy Cunard, uh, which was funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council. So we're going to get a lecture and a performance. Um, Sasha has performed from these plays in North America, in Europe, and Asia, so Gabriola Island has engaged the world. <laughs> and we're thrilled to have her engaging with us this evening. So please join with me in welcoming Sasha Colby. Sasha?
Thank you, President Petter, for that kind introduction and the invitation to speak this evening. Uh, I'd also like to thank Heather Sanders in the President's Office, who has done a wonderful job of organizing this event. Uh, I'd also like to thank our technicians, yeah, James and Mohammed, who are doing lights and sound, Dwayne, who's filming, and thank you. <laughs> everyone for coming this evening. Just to let you know, to add some excitement to this evening, we will be staging a cold reading of a Hemingway short story. Uh, and now you have some time while I am talking to think about if you'd like to be a volunteer actor. <laughs> Tonight, I would like to talk about the theater and its potential for literary studies. I would like us to think about theater's power to connect with audiences and the way at which provides physical and emotional ways of knowing that complement the more cerebral dimensions of scholarship. Now, I don't pretend that this is in any way new or that I am alone in thinking that creative research has a great deal of potential. The School for the Contemporary Arts, just down the street, is in many ways way ahead on this issue Though tonight I would like to think specifically about the ways in which literary scholars can address fundamental questions in literary studies through creative approaches. I'm also certainly not alone in my interest in creative methods within the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. I think there is something of an unacknowledged revolution at this university in particular of humanities scholars who have undertaken critical creative projects. And here I am thinking specifically about Peter Dickinson's lecture performances, about Dara Culhane's ethnographic staging of Irish history, about David Cheriandi's work, which unites post-colonial thought with the novel, and the poetry of Jeff Dirksen and Steve Collis, which explores their research interests through poetic forms. Now, while we often talk about the difference between traditional and creative scholarship, and I think we have to admit the pejorative tone around creative sometimes, as in Jimmy's project is so creative. <laughs> it may surprise you to know that the creative turn is something that has been sanctioned by the National Academic Funding Body, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, which in its report from the Working Group on the Future of the Humanities in 2010, specifically recommends that scholars seek to bridge the gap between the creative and interpretive disciplines by linking the humanities to the creative arts to explore new modes of research and of disseminating research findings, including targeting larger and more diverse public audiences. Interestingly, Shirk also recently launched its third annual Storytellers Challenge, which encourages graduate and undergraduate students to tell the story of Shirk-funded research in a way, and I quote, that is creative, compelling, and clear. <laughs> the creative, the compelling, and the clear. I think these are important words for all of us and those of us who are involved in literary studies, and that together they represent an approach that has been alluded to by the history of criticism itself. In the 1936 essay, The Storyteller, Walter Benjamin, the German theorist who so clearly foresaw our own time, writes about the difficulties of communicating experience in the modern world. The new form of communication is information, Benjamin writes. And while information and the sharing of information has advantages, for Benjamin, it also leads to a certain type of impoverishment. As for Benjamin, narrative achieves an amplitude that information lacks. Relatedly, in my view, if something of a chronological and theoretical leap, in 1966, Susan Sontag called for a new type of literary and artistic engagement. The function of criticism should be to show how it is what it is, even that it is what it is, rather than to show what it means. Both of these calls, Benjamin's urgency around narrative 
and imparting what we know through story. And Sontag's view that literary scholars should be doing more than explicating literary work strike me as challenges. Challenges to contemporary scholars in encouraging us to develop new methods of interacting both with literature and with audiences. And rather than dismiss one method for another, creative scholarship for the critical apparatus, what I would like to consider here tonight is the ways in which the utilization of both creative and critical methods could lead to a kind of bilingualism for our field with all the benefits that another disciplinary language would provide and in which we could continue to explore, translate, and communicate the value of what we do. Now, on the poster for this evening's performance, I asked people to think about the way in which the university is already full of stages, right? which is to say that lecture theaters, like this one, suggest something about the creative potential of academic spaces that's just waiting to be unlocked. But you'll see my ambitions here tonight are actually quite modest, in the sense that I would mostly like to talk about the ways in which I have observed theater and literary studies working together in the classroom, in communities, and in the processes of undertaking literary research. One of my favorite things about the theater is the way in which it brings students on stage, which is to say, in the classroom, into this space, which is so often reserved for the delivery of knowledge. So to this end, I would like to replicate an experiment that I've sometimes used in first year classes, which is to dramatize a piece of literature so that students can both inhabit the work and also recognize something about the literature they may not have otherwise through the processes of performing it. You may remember Ernest Hemingway's Hills Like White Elephants is a story about a young couple wrestling with an unexpected pregnancy at a cafe in Spain. Because it's a Hemingway story, it's all dialogue, almost all dialogue, and some narration, and also because it's a Hemingway story, it's a very short story. Right, which is to say it's no more than four pages, which ends with the couple leaving the cafe without any real sense of resolution, and the young woman saying, I feel fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. And now I would like to invite three volunteers up on stage to read a passage and illustrate, I hope, the ways in which dramatization can reveal something about the work that the eye can sometimes miss. And so, what we need in terms of volunteers, yeah, a young woman, and I mean, this is Hemingway, a girl and a man, <laughs> which we would address in class, uh, and a waitress. Yeah? Hands up. Okay, fantastic. Girl, man, waitress, waitress, very, very few. perfect, Karen, very thank well. you. Come on up. Okay, time is of the essence. Now, volunteers, you aren't mic'd, so you really have to speak up and project. Yes? Girl? Man? Waitress? Who will always serve from this side, behind? Yeah, here are the glasses. It's a Hemingway story, so we have about 12 glasses. Yeah? And if you folks can just project outward as much as you can to try and, and reach the folks at the back. And Karen, your speaking lines are in blue and your, what you do physically is in orange there, okay? The hills across the valley of the Ebro were long and white. On this side, there was no shade and no trees and the station was between two lines of rails in the sun. Close against the side of the station, there was the warm shadow of the building and a curtain made of strings of bamboo beads hung across the open door into the bar to keep out flies. The American and the girl with him sat at a table in the shade outside the building. It was very hot and the express from Barcelona would come in 40 minutes. It stopped at this junction for two minutes and went on to Madrid. Pretty hot. Let's drink beer. Don't serve us. Big ones? Yes, two big ones. 
The woman brought two glasses of beer and two felt pads. She put the felt pads and the beer glasses on the table and looked at the man and the girl. The girl was looking off at the line of hills. They were white <laughs> in the sun, and the country was brown and dry. They look like white elephants. I've never seen one. No, you wouldn't have. I might have. Just because you say I wouldn't have doesn't prove anything. They've painted something on it. What does it say? Ennis del Toro. It's a drink. Could we try it? Listen. Four reels. We want two Ennis del Toro. With water. Do you want with water? I don't know. Is it good with water? Do you want them with water? It's all right. Uh, yes, with water. That's the way with everything. Yes, everything tastes of licorice, especially all the things you've waited so long for, like your absinthe. Oh, cut it out. You started it. I was being amused. I was having a fine time. Well, let's try and have a fine time. All right, I was trying. I said the mountains looked like white elephants. Wasn't that right? That was right. I wanted to try this new drink. That's all we do, isn't it? Look at things and try new drinks. <laughs> I guess so. They're lovely hills. They don't really look like white elephants. I just meant the coloring of their skin for the trees. Should we have another drink? <laughs> All right. The beer is nice and Nice and cool. It's lovely. It's really an awfully simple operation, Jake. It's not really an operation at all. The girl looked at the ground, the table legs rested on. <laughs> Round of applause for our volunteers. Thank you. <laughs> now, if we were talking about this in class, we'd also maybe want to have a little public service announcement on drinking in pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> but in a literary sense, the pathos of Hemingway's story is actually in many ways what isn't there in the text, the written text, which is to say the time that passes while the couple is in the cafe. During the course of the visit, the couple has several drinks, but unless you are a very patient reader, the time it would take for the server to walk on the stage, deliver the drinks, and for the couple to drink them while having their conversation goes largely unobserved. And for the sake of time, we compress this, but you can imagine how long it would have taken if they'd actually had the chance to drink all of those drinks if they could have walked off the stage. It is actually only when the story is staged and the actors are reading the lines and the waitress is coming and going that you really come to realize what is going on and how agonized the discussion really is. The silences that are missing on the page but have to be present for the timing to make sense. And in this sense, students, in addition to participating in the literature, are learning something about the story and about modernist composition that likely would not have been otherwise understood. Similarly, theater can serve several purposes in the graduate classroom as well. Here are some photos. <laughs> From my Liberal Studies 819 literary biographical drama course last year, where graduate liberal studies students, rather than write formal papers, wrote and performed from their own one-act plays. In some way, the extensive research is similar to writing a paper, but as you can see, the results in the immersive form of presentation are quite different. And this is a photo from a student play about the life and writing of Canadian poet P.K. Page. 
a drama which interspersed scenes from Sons and Lovers with scenes from the life of D.H. Lawrence, and a drama about the life and writing of Tennessee Williams. The students depended on themselves and each other to perform, which is to say we did not bring act in actors, but rather the exercise was at once in writing about and embodying the work of these writers. In graduate liberal studies this semester, I'm teaching a course called Writing and Performing the Modernist Self, in which students are studying both the work and context of interwar Paris in order to create theater reflective both of this environment and the writers and artists working within it. In talking about theater in classrooms and in communities, I'm interested in the ways in which performance can animate the material, create a complement to critical learning, and create bridges between the university and communities beyond. But I also think it is important to be clear that theater in particular, and creative approaches in general, have a great deal of potential for transforming the ways in which literary research itself is undertaken and understood, and as a result, are not only teaching tools or outreach strategies. Several years ago, in this very theater, in fact, I performed an experimental dramatization from the life and writing of modernist poet H.D., a 24-character, two-hour, one-woman show, which is, uh, yes, I've, I've since cut it a bit. <laughs> um, and don't worry, we don't have three hours here tonight. Uh, a 24-character, two-hour, one-woman show, which was a joint presentation of SFU Vancouver and the Vancouver Fringe Festival. Now this was a solo performance, mostly because at the time I didn't have any money to hire actors in terms of grants, uh, and also because it was experimental and I was nervous about involving other people in a potential disaster. <laughs> but in the intervening years, this project has become part of my book called Staging Modernist Lives, which juxtaposes theoretical writing with solo performance scripts that adapt the autobiographical materials of HD, pen name of poet Hilda Doolittle, uh, largely known for her poetry, but who also wrote extensive memoirs and Romain à Clef, Mina Loy, the modernist writer and visual artist, and Nancy Kennard, the poet, biographer, and social activist. At this point in the book's development, I have been working with professional actors in filming excerpts from the plays that will be included in the e-book. And this opportunity to collaborate with actors, notably veteran theater and film actor Gina Stockdale, who recently filmed a wonderful excerpt from the Mina Loy play, has amplified the conversation about how to approach modernist autobiographical writing and how to share it with others. However, tonight and in this theater, where in a certain sense it all began, I would like to return to the life and writing of H.D. In many ways, H.D. had one of those lives that was made for the stage, not only because of her own accomplishments in poetry, prose, and filmmaking, but also because of the range and scope of her experience and acquaintance. Born in Pennsylvania in 1896, H.D. was an early writer who developed teenage friendships <coughs> with poets William Carlos Williams and Ezra Pound. The friendship with Pound turned into romance, and they were twice engaged during a complicated, though in a literary sense, productive relationship. When Pound left for England in 1909 to pursue his literary fortunes, H.D. found herself both romantically and artistically compatible with fellow student Francis Gregg. After touring Europe with Gregg and Gregg's mother, H.G. remained in London with Pound and joined the avant-garde circle of expatriate writers who were beginning to forge new modes of poetic expression, including imagism, which H.G. would be so crucial in defining. In London, H.G. also met and eventually married the poet Richard Aldington, and together they would work on several avant-garde journals and Greek translations. H.D. would stay in London throughout the war years while Aldington fought in France, though the war took significant toll on both of them and their marriage. Eventually, they would separate, and H.D. would find her long-term partner, Briar Ellerman, 
with whom HD would collaborate on literary and film projects. Most of this history is documented in HD's experimental and autobiographical prose, which includes various memoirs and published and unpublished romans à clef. HD also undertook psychoanalysis with Freud in Vienna, which she would document in her memoir, Tribute to Freud. This book gives us insight into HD's growing uneasiness in Vienna in the late 30s. She would spend the Second World War years in London with Breyer. In addition to the trauma of the bombings, HD Plea was deeply affected by the news that Pound had been making pro-fascist radio broadcasts in Italy, an activity that would lead to him being tried for treason in absentia in America and at war's end arrested and imprisoned in Pisa before being transferred to the United States for trial. The play that I have adapted from these materials, The Tree, draws on this history and on the published and archival records that document the time, notably H.G.'s Hermione, Asphodel, Tribute to Freud, Painted Today, and End to Torment, her memoir about Pound. In so much as a two-hour play can, it attempts to address the major social and artistic currents of H.G.'s life, with a significant emphasis on H.G.'s life with Breyer. For the purposes of this evening's performance, however, I have excerpted 17-minute scene, which melds the beginning and the ending of the play, and showcases H.G.'s conflicted relationship with Pound, since it is this relationship that allows us to see H.G. from the time she is an aspiring teenage writer in Philadelphia, through to her final years at a sanatorium in Switzerland. In the piece, you can hear H.G.'s development from the relatively flat accent of Pennsylvania at the turn of the century to the British inflections which would characterize her later speech, largely as a result of her expatriatism and her mostly British circle. Pound, whose accent also changes as a result of his time abroad, is relatively unchanged in the writing of H.D. And in this sense, Pound would seem to represent something fixed in her mind about home and the American tone. It is an elderly HD at the sanatorium in Switzerland who narrates the play. Mostly, I think the dramatization of HD's writing allows us to see the ways in which she is very much teller of her own story. And this is part of what I hope to be able to relay to you this evening through this short performance. In 1901, Ezra Pound was maybe 16. I was a year younger. Immensely sophisticated, immensely superior, immensely rough and ready, a product not like any of my brothers or brothers' friends. I suffered excruciatingly for his clumsy dancing. I suffered. Indeed, I suppose we all did. He himself, in a, a certain sense, made no mistakes. He gave, he took, he gave extravagantly. One would dance with him for what he might say. Hilda Doolittle, what a queer name. Hasn't anyone ever told you you look more like a wood spirit? 
a dryad, a very tall one. No. And what are you supposed to be? Well, it's a Halloween party, isn't it? I'm a Tunisian princeling. I purchased this headpiece on my travels in Africa. Africa. Yes, Tunisia, extraordinary culture. I wrote a great many poems to tall women while I was there. <laughs> there was a tree house that my younger brother had built. Bench boards and a, a sort of platform. From there, the house was hidden by great branches. Ezra's kisses were electric, magnetic. They did not so much warm, they magnetized, vitalized. Look, Ezra, it's the last trolley. You don't want to miss the last train to Wincott. Come on. No, Dryad. He snatches me back. We sway with the wind. There is no wind. We sway with the stars. They are not far. We slide, slip, fly down through the branches, leap together to the ground. No, I say, breaking from his arms. No, drawing back from his kisses. I'll run ahead and stop the trolley. You get your books, things, whatever you left in the hall. I'll get them next time. Run, run. He just catches the trolley, swaying dangerously, barely stopping, only half stopping. Now I must face them in the house. He was late again. My father was winding the clock. My mother said, where were you? I was calling. Didn't you hear me? Where is Ezra Pound? Oh, he's gone. But his books, hat, he'll get them next time. Why had I ever come down out of that tree? To Mr. William Carlos Williams, dearest Bill, it is important that I let you know that I have decided to get to dedicate my life and love to one who has been beyond all others, torn and lonely and ready to crucify himself yet more for the sake of helping all. I mean that I have promised to marry Ezra. I tell you, Billy, because you are to me nearer and dearer than many, than most. The next few months were much the same. Ezra's kisses, Ezra's books, Ezra filling room, filling space. There was no air for studies at Bryn Mawr. I left in my second year, having done badly in mathematics and English. I read the books that Ezra gave me. Ibsen, Swinburne, mystical yogi books. I watched the sky.
in London, people did not laugh at Ezra. People asked his opinion a little reverently. It was funny watching people reverencing Ezra. He had done a, a, a book on Dante and Provence and Renaissance Latin poetry. Ezra in London. His clothes were not so odd here. His little brush of a beard and his velvet coats and his cravats like flowers, a maroon and mosaic of green vermilion. Ezra did not look odd, though he looked more odd than ever. People didn't seem to mind, didn't waste time commenting on his clothes, said, Ezra Pound, odd fellow. He has a flair for beauty. They were high times in London on the literary scene. There were parties, and there was poetry. Yeats, Ford, Maddox, Ford. It was the war before the Great War to free modern poetry from Romanticism, Victorianism, and adjectives. <laughs> there were debates about metrical experiments subjects from contemporary life, natural language. On these occasions, Ezra's poetry may not have been the best, but it was certainly the loudest. <laughs> Damn it all, all this our South stinks. Peace. You, horse on dog, papials, come. Let's to music. I have no life save when the swords flash. But uh, when I see the standards gold, there, purple opposing, and the broad fields beneath them turn crimson. Then howls my heart nigh mad with rejoicing. Hands closed over Ezra's mouth, a slim, elegant shape crowded into the divan between me and Ezra. Ezra, <laughs> darling. <laughs> Ezra had removed the hands from his mouth and was gallantly, in his best Provençal manner, kissing them. Backs of small hands. Yes, Ezra did it nicely. So <gasps> quaint of you, dearest, to read that poem. <laughs> Why, Princess Bridget? Well, you told me, didn't you, that it was written for moi? Did I? Maybe. But you see, I tell everybody that. Oh, Ezra, shockingly inadequate. If you are being cutting, be cutting. I slunk further into the corner of the divan. Who was this maroon-colored person who had stolen Ezra? Ezra was petting her, making himself charming. Listen, Bridget, if you don't mind. Halt, dear Ezra. There's someone you've not noticed in the corner. Hilda. 
Oh, but I have. <laughs> I did notice. But are you sure it's quite grown up? Why do you ever let it come to parties? <laughs> Listen, my dear. Let me introduce you to someone, another enfant like yourself. Richard? Richard. This is Hilda Doolittle, the American. Hilda, this is Richard Aldington. He writes such beautiful poems, don't you, darling? And what a gorgeous mustache. Come along, Ezra. It was 1912. Ezra. Bridget. Richard. A French critic named Flint and I spent most every afternoon in tea shops talking about poetry. We were all writing or trying to. Then one day, in the tea shop of the British Museum, I gave four of my new poems to Ezra. I waited in silence as he read. The hard sand breaks, and the grains of it are clear as wine. Far off over the leagues of it, the wind playing on the wide shore piles little ridges, and the great waves break over it. The dryad, this is poetry. Yeah, cut this out, shorten this line. <laughs> Hermes of the Ways, it's a, it's a good title. I'll send it to Harriet Monroe of Poetry. Have you a copy? Yes, then, then we'll send this or I'll, I'll type it when I get back. Now a name. H.D. Imagist. Dear Harriet, I enclose poetry from a new poet. H. D. It is direct, objective, no slither, no excessive use of adjectives, no metaphors that won't permit examination. It's straight talk. Straight as the Greek. I suppose that might be what you would call the beginning. What can I tell you about the end? In 1933, I, I began my sessions with Freud in Vienna. It was clear another war was coming. I needed to prepare myself. Won't you recline, Mrs. Aldington? Now, if you don't mind my saying, I can see you are going to be difficult. And now, although it is against the rules, I will tell you something else. You were disappointed, and you are disappointed in me. In truth, I may have been disappointed he was not taller. <laughs> I had always imagined Freud was a giant, but I was taller than he was. Friends at home were not altogether pleased I was seeing the professor. Ezra wrote, <sighs> You got into the wrong pigsty, ma chère.
but not too late to climb out. Yet already in Vienna, the shadows were lengthening. There were occasional coquettish, confetti-like showers from the air, gilded paper swastikas, and narrow bits of printed paper, like the ones we pulled from our Christmas bonbons. The party had begun. All this was preliminary to the birthday or the wedding. I stooped to scrape up a handful of these confetti-like tokens as I was leaving the Hotel Regina one morning. Hitler gives bread. Hitler gives work. The paper was crisp and clean, but the gold would not stay bright, nor the paper crisp very long. I left Vienna for London before the war started. In the end, it was Ezra who got into the wrong pigsty, making pro-Mussolini radio broadcasts for the fascists in Rome. My sessions with Freud. have not prepared me for this war. I was not strong enough. After the war, Ezra was arrested for high treason, they locked him up in a cage at Pisa. Prison, actually, you know, of the self, was dramatized materialized for our generation by Ezra's incarceration. He composed his peas and cantos, his best work, locked up in that cave. with clouds over Taishan, Chikorwa. When the blackberry ripens, and now the new moon faces Taishan, one must count by the dawn star. Riad, thy peace is like water. There is September sun 
on the pool. I suppose there was always a challenge in his creative power. I suppose there was unconscious, and I mean really unconscious, rivalry. It all began with them. The Greek fragments. And living in the seclusion, I wrote a, a very long epic sequence. My cantos. I say there is only one image. One picture, though the swords flash. I say there is one treasure, one desire as the wheels turn, and the hooves of the stallion thunder across the plain, and the plain is dust, and the battlefield is a heap of rusty staves and broken chariot frames, and the rims of the dented shields and desolation, destruction. For what? There is a photograph of Ezra as he left the Pisan camp, fettered between two detectives. When tried, he was judged insane and sentenced to St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital. I look at the photograph of Ezra. <laughs> there is an old man, they say. It is only by admitting that Ezra is an old man that I can say that I am an old woman. But this is not true. There are others. They go on painting pictures, or they go on writing poetry. They go on. Though sometimes I do wonder why I ever came down out of that tree. ready to take Master of Arts in Liberal Studies? <laughs> we should definitely have cross-listed tonight's lecture with the Push Festival. It was amazing. Um, there's a chance for comments or questions and 
Sasha has very kindly agreed to try to respond to, uh, to either. We'll, we'll take a, f a few for uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, and then, as I say, there'll be a chance to, uh, to congregate uh, in a reception environment at the end. So who has a question or a comment or a dramatization they'd like to share? <laughs> Hands up. They're stund, as my mother-in-law would like to say. Over here. Okay, great. This is how I get my exercise. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for a wonderful talk and performance. I was wondering about um, how you would use um, maybe non-narrative forms of literature, how you would involve students in acting those out, um, poetry without obvious narratives or that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Great question, Diana. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's an interesting question, right? And the, the whole question of narrative around avant-garde movements is, is a bit of a tricky question because, of course, so much of what the avant-garde tried to do was to escape from narrative, right? So there, there are issues of containment uh, and, you know, some really interesting questions about how you dramatize lives like these. Uh, so in terms of sort of recuperating that avant-gardism in poetry in particular, uh, I think that, that just learning to say the poetry aloud. And I know that many of us have, have parents who did this, right, in their, in their English classes, that this actually used to be part of the curriculum where you would learn things and internalize them and recite them and they would become a part of you. And so, you know, 30 years later, my dad can still recite something that he learned in school. Uh, and so I think, I think that internalization is something that we've lost a little bit and should recuperate it. Uh, and this is actually something that Charles Bernstein refers to as close listening. And those of you involved in literary studies know that close reading is where you take a passage from a poem and you look at it very closely and how the, inter the internal elements are working together. But what Bernstein suggests is that we can actually learn a lot through listening to poetry, to poetry off the page, to the sound of the words. Uh, and recently in my, in my seminar, we were talking about Mina Loy and she, she talks about how she, she simply wrote poetry for the sound of the words. And whether that's true in its entirety or not, it's certainly part of it. So I think recuperating the sound of the words uh, in the literary classroom by having students spend some time reading the work, learning the work, playing with the inflections, learning about ambiguity and irony through different tones right, in the poetry. Uh, is an extremely valuable way of, of learning what it's all about. Anyone else? We don't have to, but I want you to have a chance. Well, if not, ah, I thought maybe SFU's own poet laureate, Cherez, over here would want to <laughs> ask a question. <laughs> maybe an iambic pentameter. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your knowledge. My question is, how, how do, do uh, people in other uh, uh, languages mm. share the, uh, the message you are trying to share? Because mm -hmm. I think in different uh, uh, ethnic groups have a similar style of memorizing, especially the older literature. And I was wondering how to compare your style with the ones from other mm -hmm. uh, ethnic groups. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because certainly, you know, the, the internalizing of the epic, right, which, you know, a form that we find throughout the world and reciting it and storytelling, you know, that, that's a really common trait in most cultures. So you're sort of, it's one of the things that I think we have to be aware of a bit, like Benjamin, about the things that, that die out with the surplus of information. Uh, and so when I had performed this play, you know, I'm thinking notably in Japan, where I think sort of the language barrier was most significant with the most number of people in the audience. Uh, it was very similar where I, I, you know, I gave a talk somewhat like this one, uh, and, and then I would perform from the work of HD. Uh, and it's funny how people's eyes glaze over when you give a talk, uh, as, you know, especially when people can't understand the language. And the ways in which their eyes often open up again 
uh, when you perform something, right? And, and it's the emotion that's carrying it. Uh, and that is conveying so much of the meaning rather than the words themselves. Um, so in that sense, performance was very effective in, you know, in other traditions and other cultures. And whether that's because it resonated with some kind of traditional literature or experience or whether it's because the emotion itself was carrying the day uh, is probably an open question. But certainly it helped me make bonds abroad more easily than just the theoretical writing ever could. Anyone else? Jerry, you? <laughs> Are you bidding or? <laughs> Th thank you, Sasha. That's just, the, the representation of, of authorship on the, <clears throat> on the stage um, is <clears throat> what, I, what I saw you do um, beautifully is, is to rep represent authorship, right? Not just dramatically, but, but uh, in a thoughtful way, right? But I, I wondered in, in all your thinking and working about um, this through, did, did your reading of Freud have any uh, effect? I mean, what kind of an effect did, did the reading of Freud have? Um, I think he was, Freud was probably uh, in love with her uh, mm -hmm. in, some, in some way mm -hmm. and, and recognized that in the, uh, in the, in the uh, way in which uh, she recognized it too, I think, in, in her uh, book, in the tribute to Freud. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, did you want to say anything more about the relationship there? Yeah, thank you, Jerry. And of course, our Freud expert would ask the, the perfect Freud question. So thank you for that. Um, it, I mean, Tribute to Freud is a wonderful book. Uh, and I hope that something of what the play might do is to introduce people to H.G. and her work and that they might say, huh, H.G. and Freud, maybe I'll read up in that, and, and to sort of go and pursue it on their own. Uh, I, really, I really decided to shrink the part with Freud for the purposes of tonight and focus on Pound. But in the full play, there is a, a much more extensive relationship that's established with Freud. And as you point out, Jerry, it was a really interesting dynamic that took place between them, where at one point Freud says to H.D., uh, well, you know, you think I'm too old for you to love me, right? And, and that it's quite clear that, that whatever dynamic was emerging between, between Annalise and Lausanne, it was, it was, it was, a lot of it was motivated on Freud's behalf. Uh, and so it's interesting to think about them in the room together. It's interesting to see the way in which H.G. takes what Freud says and his ideas and contemplates them and thinks about them quite deeply and what she adopts and what she rejects right, in terms of, of moving forward with her own work. But Freud certainly had a, a therapeutic effect for her in the sense that uh, you know, she went partly because of a paralyzing writer's block. Uh, and that work with him and that digging down and digging in allowed her to, to move forward and write some of her best work. Well, I think uh, we've had an incredible... One question? Oh, here we go. Is your father... Oh, no, you have, to, you have to use the microphone here. It's part Is of your... <laughs> Unconditional surrender. <laughs> Is your father in the room? Both my parents are here. <laughs> Brian and Lucy Colby. There they go. <laughs> Um, I just want to say on behalf of all of us, just thank you so much, uh, Sasha, you, for just a fabulous lecture, performance, demonstration of uh, performance as, as teaching, performance uh, in explicating literature and in demonstrating, as well as telling us uh, of your research and of your work. It's uh, just been wonderful and really, really appreciate the, uh, having had the opportunity. So please join with me in expressing our collective appreciation <laughs> to Sasha <laughs> Now, there, there will be some very light refreshments, these being hard economic times for the university, but, uh, but lots of nourishment in the discussion. I hope you'll join us. Uh, this lecture series is part of a larger program called SFU Public Square. Uh, I encourage you to go to the website and see some of the other uh, activities that SFU Public Square is hosting uh, to really bring the university and the community together. The next in the faculty lecture series will take place on March 26th at the Shadbolt Center for the Arts in Burnaby. 
So come on out to Burnaby. Uh, Professor of Biodiversity Arnie Moores will be discussing how science can help us to ensure the future of the planet's biodiversity uh, with a lecture that's entitled, What to Let Go, Making Hard Choices in the Age of Extinction. So uh, this lecture series <laughs> covers a wide range of topics. And, uh, and, and topics that are all important to us in, in so many different ways as tonight's lecture was. So thank you, thank you so much for coming out and please, uh, please join us at that lecture series and do check out the SFU Public, Where, uh, Public Square website. Thanks and stay for the reception. Good night. Thank you so much.